Welcome back to the third panel of the Middle East Institute 71st Conference. Um, panel today, this afternoon, that we're looking at is Relief Needs and Development Horizons. The two expert panels that uh, I hope you were here to enjoy this morning devoted most of their attention to the armed conflicts uh, in the region, the grievances and the rivalries that uh, were drivers to those armed conflicts and national security interests of the stakeholders. In this section, we want to do something different. We want to take stock of the tragic human impact on the uh, four major conflicts that are going on in the region. But importantly, uh, we want to discuss and call attention to the ways that uh, people in the region can move forward constructively. We don't want to dwell on all the horrible things. We want to see and examine and hash out what we can do about them, what is being done about them, who's taking the leadership. Uh, and there are challenges. Uh, first, the region faces the urgent crisis of disease and malnutrition, especially in Yemen and Syria. We've all read about it. Uh, civil wars have destroyed uh, homes, business, and infrastructure, but also institutions um, in the, f uh, in the uh, four conflict areas, including trust. We'll talk about that. And the financial, and the thirdly, the third largest challenge we face in the recovery period is the financial uh, requirements for reconstruction and the <clears throat> at a time when uh, many donors, particularly in the West, are facing donor fatigue um, uh, without any reduction at all in the needs for caring for refugees and for the enormous humani uh, recovery need, uh, challenges that are coming forward. So the urgency in uh, addressing these huge challenges raises a lot of critical questions, which this panel is very um, well designed to address. Who will lead the work? Uh, are there legitimate local and national authorities who can mobilize and lead during a recovery period? What, is, what should be and what is the role of the international community? And are there new actors? We want to address what, what the role of Iran, China, and Russia might be. Um, and uh, what are the role of other major donors? What will it take to reestablish good enough governance in the future? So to review all of these issues and challenges, we've got a wonderful panel of experts uh, here with me on the podium. Simon Henshaw is the Acting Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration at uh, Department of State. And he'll help us uh, sort through some of these challenges with refugees, for sure. Ambassador Mike Clausen uh, is Vice President for Policy and Humanitarian Response at the Global NGO and highly esteemed NGO, Save the Children. Michael deals with problems of delivering humanitarian aid well throughout the world. Um, the other two experts will guide our thinking beyond the immediate humanitarian crisis um, as we begin to plan for the future and navigate towards that difficult period of transitioning into recovery. Claire Lockhart is co-founder and director of the Institute for State Effectiveness, and she's co-author with uh, and a superb book uh, on the same subject with Afsuskani, who is now president of Afghanistan, and Hadiki Matsunaga, 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 yeah. uh, is advisor to the chief economist of the Middle East MENA region in the World Bank, who are very active in thinking and planning and strategizing for uh, the future in this region. So let's start, and let's start. Uh, let's start with you, Simon. Uh, on humanitarian problems. Let's start on the here and now. And uh, I'm sorry to say, Simon, that even though the U.S. and the coalition has succeeded in its number one priority in, in Iraq and Syria of driving out uh, ISIS, uh, the future of refugees and the displaced in the region seems to be just as troubling as ever before. So if I can ask you uh, to just describe what's happening on the ground now, but importantly, and because we want to stay uh, with this positive theme, if you can see any positive trends towards refugees and what is what uh, donors are planning and strategizing uh, to do and 
what their future might be? Well, that's a broad question, but I'll, uh, I'll give it You're a welcome. try. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there are some positive changes on the ground. Certainly, that uh, the, the uh, near defeat of ISIS uh, has opened up a lot of territory for, um, for, from uh, fighting, which has uh, decreased hu humanitarian problems. But we still have a long way to go, and I, I think, um, I think especially uh, in Syria, where the Assad regime remains in power, a lot of refugees are unwilling to return back home until they see some sort of political solution. So that's the, the difficult uh, part there. Even as areas are liberated from us, ISIS or fighting ceases, uh, we still have a state which is split into many different parts with different groups in control of different areas and a lot of questions about where the future lies. So it's unlikely that refugees will voluntarily return home um, until there's some sort of stability that they can return to. Uh, inside Syria, there's a large number of IDPs. Uh, many of them are in Assad-controlled areas. And uh, it will be important to watch how they move within the next months, whether they start to move back to uh, their, their homes. I, I say this because it's a good leading indicator for refugees. In today's modern communications, there's a lot of communication back and forth that it far outweighs what we say or international organizations say. So um, if, if uh, internally displaced persons with inside Syria begin to um, move back, to their homes, they'll then text or write or email uh, refugee family members in other countries, and that could be uh, an indicator of uh, a lead into an ev eventual return. But I think we have a, a period of time where we're going to have to continue to support refugees in the countries ar around Syria. Inside Iraq, there is some uh, movement of uh, IDPs back to back to their homes, which is uh, a good news. But the recent Fighting would be the wrong word, I guess, and probably not po politique, but the recent uh, disagreements between the Kurds and the central government uh, have led to a, a new wave of IDPs moving into Kurdistan, I think about 160,000. So there are new concerns there uh, which, which will need to be addressed. Um, in the area, in, in, the, in the host in the refugee hosting countries, I think we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of years. From originally when I first started, did this five years ago, when we were just sort of doing Band-Aid, uh, get food, get shelter, uh, get water, get uh, sanitation. There's been a lot of movement towards uh, particularly providing education and providing jobs for refugees, so uh, there has been some movement there. Probably more successful on the education side, particularly in Lebanon and, and Jordan, where the majority of refugees, younger children now receive education, but also some good moves in employment, and that's very important because it helps families support themselves, lessens the social uh, welfare costs for the state, and helps uh, uh, restore or, or retain dignity for families so that they can support themselves and. Uh, and get by. I think uh, I will just add that uh, the, um, the uh, current political issues in Lebanon are, are somewhat um, uh, disturbing. Uh, Harari, the prime minister, was probably the biggest supporter of refugees with inside the government. And uh, it'd be, um, uh, it, it's, worth, it's very important to watch to see what happens there. With 25% of their population being Syrian refugees, uh, the situation was already unstable. I, uh, I think I'll leave any uh, comments on the World Bank to my distinguished uh, okay. uh, yeah, let, colleague. Let, let me here. just uh, follow up on a couple of things that you said. Um, the uh, reluctance of Syrian refugees to go home until they see some stability. We, they must not have been uh, very happy with the recent comment by President uh, Assad, uh, where he actually seemed to discourage uh, refugees from going home. Uh, I know in August he had his big conference where he declared the, uh, the insurgency over and Syria was open for business. 
Um, but he also has said that he want, he, his vision for Syria was as a homogeneous society, uh, which meant he wanted to exclude those who had chosen to leave. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, how is the United States government reacting to that? Because, I mean, one of the principles of refugees uh, is that uh, the, the, the most favorable, durable solution is that refugees go home, and that's what they want to do. They want to go home. But to have uh, in, a, in a situation where they're still not welcome, what is our policy towards a leader who says that? Yeah, well, I, I run the humanitarian side of the shop, so I, I get to stay out of politics. But I'll, I'll repeat what our political uh, leaders say, which is, uh, the future of Syria requires a political solution among all parties, and, uh, and Assad is uh, not part of, part of that future. Um, that's all I can really say, other than, uh, you know, I've concentrated on the humanitarian side, and you're absolutely right. The uh, first durable solution is the return of refugees to their home. And um, in certain circumstances, such as uh, Lebanon, it really is the only, only practical solution. And then I'll just, uh, as you did the round robin throughout the region uh, with the four conflicts, uh, we didn't talk about Libya. Or Yemen. Or Yemen. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask you a question on Libya and Yemen. <laughs> uh, on Libya, of course, many of the refugees from countries from throughout, well, throughout the world, but mostly throughout the Middle East, including Afghanistan and Pakistan and certainly Africa, have used Libya as a route mm -hmm. uh, to hop on boats. And now Europeans uh, are turning those boats back. And isn't this a violation of a refugee principle? And, and what is our position on that? Are we talking to our allies about that? Yeah, we, we uh, are talking to our allies. We certainly encourage them to use humanitarian processes. Um, I don't think the answer is uh, allowing people to the sea in rickety boats, though, because the, the death rate is fairly high. And uh, there is this delicate balance between accepting people who are, uh, are refugees and, and uh, dealing with a mixed migration, which also contains economic migrants. You also have the situation where um, the, the rescues themselves, as rescuers got closer to the Libyan shore, the Libyan smugglers used rick rickier, and is that a word? Yeah. More, more, it works. More rickety <laughs> boats uh, because they knew they needed to go less far. So it, it requires some sort of cooperation between Libyan authorities and Europeans to get that under control. And part of that is also uh, establishing legal methods for, for migration. Uh, a couple other things about Libya that I'd just like to throw in. I, I think one of the, the hidden horrors here, maybe not for this audience, but for much of, the, much of Americans and Europeans, is the deaths of, uh, of Africans crossing the desert. We, we see photos and pictures mm. and read reports of uh, people dying in the Mediterranean, but there are reports that suggest an equal or greater number of people die coming across the desert, and that's hidden from us. So we really need to, to push our effort back even further and work in the countries from which migrants are coming. And are we doing that, and how are we doing that? And what sort of positive strategies do we have uh, for, to address that problem? Yeah, you know, positive strategies, again, getting out of my bailiwick, I, I just get to deal with, uh, with uh, working with people who are in the situation of being a refugee in the first place. I think you're talking about a much wider uh, issue here, which is one of economic migration. And we are participating in the, in the global um, migration dialogue. And the hope is that that can come up with some rules on, on how better to deal with migrants and look for way more legal paths for migrants to move, and also better controls of movement uh, from countries uh, that produce the migrants. Good. Well, thank you. That's very helpful, Simon. Uh, Mike, let's stay on humanitarian issues. Um, the conflict in Syria, Libya, Yemen, and Iraq uh, have been brutal uh, on the lives of civilians, in particular children. And uh, we all know the statistics. They're pretty startling. But it's also had an enormous, one of the issues in, is that I find has been overlooked 
by everybody but save the children, uh, is the psychological aspects, the mental health needs for particularly children who have uh, been uprooted from their, their homes, displaced, uh, facing disease, having watched many of the relatives uh, killed. The mental health issues uh, in the camps and among uh, refugee populations everywhere is, is often neglected. Uh, so <coughs> Save the Children is doing some really good work in this area. Can you talk a little bit uh, about the, your mental health programs? And, and, and just to say that because the Middle East Institute has recognized the importance of art uh, in politics, the connection of, uh, in the Middle East and establishing an arts and culture program, you also have established an arts program as part of your mental health program in dealing with political violence and civil war. So if you could talk a little bit about that, I appreciate it. Sure, thanks, Wendy. Um, and let, let me actually start in a, in a slightly larger frame. Mm -hmm. I mean, the way you structure this panel, it's relief needs and development horizons. But you've actually put a humanitarian person right next to a development person instead of putting the humanitarians at one and then development people at the other. And I think that's exactly right. Because we, we're sort of, you know, the, the topic separates the here and the now from the, you know, down the road. And that, there maybe was a time when that made sense. But nowadays, when you look at a lot of the humanitarian crises, you don't have a crisis and after a reasonable period of time it's over and you're into recovery. It doesn't work like that. Most of the time, I'd say 85% of the humanitarian work that we're certainly involved in, I think governments are involved in, they're protracted. And, and particularly in refugee situations, if, you're, you know, if you've been a refugee for five years, the odds are you're going to be a refugee for about 20. So the, the world that we're dealing with is a protracted world. And so it's not enough anymore to just put a roof over somebody's head, to put food on a table, and give them access to health care. Things like mental health and education can't wait. Because you're, in effect, you're sort of saying it. Well, that's got to wait until, the, you know, until their childhood is gone. So one of the reasons, I mean, there's, you know, one of the things that has really driven it's that, that sort of realization that when you're in these protracted situations, um, people don't go home right away, and so you do have to start worrying about children growing up without an education, and, and then you, you know, you worry about no lost generations and that type of thing. Um, and in the case of mental health, this is you know, it's clearly a need. Nobody's really talking about it. Much of the time, people say, well, we'll take care of that later. That's sort of a nice to have, not an essential. And if you're thinking about having a generation then, you know, who's going to come eventually, <laughs> hopefully, come back and rebuild their country, you can't put this stuff off. And so what Save the Children has been doing, particularly in the Middle East, but it's becoming more mainstreamed across our programs, is to, is to really flag the importance of really paying attention to the impact of conflict on children. And we've brought out, some of you may have seen this report that we did in, at the sixth anniversary of the Syria conflict called Invisible Wounds, which dealt with this, this sort of the mental health of um, Syrian, Syrian children. And we interviewed roughly 500 Syrian children, um, adults, and uh, adolescents. And out of that, there's some really, I mean, it's, it's sort of hair-curling <laughs> kinds of stories. And you, have, you know, children, this is a, a little child from um, Eastern Ghouta in, in Syria. I feel depressed as if I'm in another world. When I wake up, I realize I'm still here, and then I cannot move my body. There's all this type of stuff in this report, and it just drives home that these mental health issues have to be dealt with you know, sooner rather than later. You, they, you're dealing with them can't wait. And there's the uh, statistics. I won't go through a lot of the other findings in here, but it really does flag the importance of doing that. And so we've been developing a number of different ways of, of at a fairly rudimentary level, of tackling some of these mental health issues. And we have, as Wendy was suggesting, we have a, a, something called the HEART program, Healing through arts, education and arts, and it's a way for um, children actually to kind of draw pictures and, and articulate some of the things that are going on in, in, inside them and just kind of get it out there. And so we have different levels of, um, of programming that can help children deal with these things. Some of it's really basic, like the heart program. Others get more where you actually need expertise. And so what we're saying is that this needs to be increasingly part of mainstream humanitarian programming, and it's something. I was on a, we have a, a relationship with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and we had a conference call with them recently, and this is very much, you know, something they're focused on as well, that we, we have to make much more visible the mental health issues that, you know, children in particular, but also parents are, are facing and start to tackle them as something that has to be tackled now, because if you wait, 
you know, the, the, you have something called to toxic stress. Um, and this is, I mean, it, it changes the way your brain is wired. It can, ca it can cause increased vulnerability to heart disease, diab diabetes, all kinds of really horrible stuff. And you don't want a generation of kids growing up with this kind of issue. So, you know, what we're saying is that we can do some rudimentary stuff. We need to start to build national capacity in, in, these, in countries where this is not, hasn't been too much of a tradition. I think in Syria, um, prior to the conflict, I think they had two public psychiatric hospitals, so it's not something that was mainstream that, that country, but it's something that, you know, over time, people need to pay a lot more attention to, and that's part of what we're, we've done. We've done this report on Syria. We've done one called um, Unbearable Burden on Iraq. We're bringing out some more. So we're going to be doing, you know, sort of advocating in, in favor of greater attention to this um, and also building it into all of our programming, whether it's in Yemen or whether it's in Iraq or whether it's in Syria or other conflict situations. And what I would say is that um, it, we, we have these um, things called child-friendly spaces, which is where a lot of this work gets done. And what I would say is that when you, when I've gone and seen some of our child-friendly space work, either in camps in Jordan or in host communities or in, in Lebanon, it's, it's really positive that you, you actually see the resilience in the children. And when you get a chance to talk with some of the parents and ask, you know, how, wh how has this uh, helped or, or not? Um, and what you typically hear is that, the, you know, kids are sleeping better, there's less bedwetting, that kind of thing going on. So I think it is, and it's a proven method to, to do a certain level of help, and then beyond that, people need to be referred and, and have more, more serious kinds of treatment. That's bravo. I hadn't, hadn't planned on, on sharing this story, but uh, I think it's relevant when I was, before I came to the Middle East Institute and was with uh, the UN Refugee Agency in Geneva, we were vi visiting the, uh, the Somalia refugee camp in Daldab in Kenya and helped establish a sports program for girls. Uh, and recall, you reading the quote from that little girl made, reminded me that we visited this little girl who was involved in the volleyball program. And she said, you know, uh, before the sports program, uh, I used to sit in my tent, and they gave me embroidery to do. But sitting in the dark tent, all I could think about was the things that I had seen. But when I'm out in the sun playing volleyball, uh, I don't think about those horrors. And uh, that, that one little comment has, has really stayed with me. It's so important uh, to have positive programs uh, for, for children, and well, not just children, for everybody. Right. So bravo for, for what you're doing. Hadiki, yes. the West Bank, the World Bank. Uh, yeah. You know, you all have, are playing a much more active role throughout the Middle East now, and there's certainly a lot to do mm -hmm. uh, with the, uh, com the nature of the conflict and the bombing with Aleppo, Homs, Raqqa, Mosul uh, in rubble. The, the needs for, for uh, reconstruction are huge. Uh, at a time when the um, willingness to spend a lot of money from previous donor countries is, is, is certainly not there uh, as much as it had been in the past. Um, World Bank's stepping up. And if you could just describe to me what uh, you, the, the thinking of the World Bank th throughout the region is on uh, reconstruction needs uh, and rebuilding infrastructures. Sure, okay. Uh, maybe before I touch upon about the reconstruction recovery, I would like to just follow up the previous, you know, discussion yeah. of mm -hmm. the, I mean, Simon and Michael. And uh, as Michael, I mean, correctly said, uh, there is no really a clear line between humanitarian development any longer. The situation is so protracted, and uh, because of this, you know, situation. World Bank decided to engage more actively, even in a refugee crisis. And we have set up a, a new financial mechanism called Global Concessional Financing Facility. With that fund, we are now trying to uh, support those refugee, uh, I mean, who are right now living in a neighboring country, such as Lebanon and Jordan. The point is, uh, when the, you mentioned about donor fatigue, you know, there are certain limitation on the sort of the donor grant contribution. So what we have come out is mixed grant with loan and provide support to those 
Lebanon or Jordan who are bearing so much cost of hosting those refugees. Mm -hmm. And that's really a new mechanism we are now you know, working on. And this kind of new idea came up based on the, our new strategy, which we formulated also in 2015. And uh, under this strategy, we try to engage in uh, you, you know, contributing to the peace and stability in the region directly through our engagement. Previously, World Bank considered uh, conflict and balance as a rather given factor, and our recovery and reconstruction engagement starts usually after some kind of peace agreement is made. But we flip the picture and we try to engage to contribute to achieve peace and stability. Of course, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And how are we gonna do it? In maybe, I, I think, uh, maybe twofold. One is try to address the root cause of conflict and violence. The other thing is try to respond to the urgent consequences. One is a refugee crisis, you, and, uh, and uh, as well as a recovery and reconstruction from the war. So we try to do that, and setting up a under this strategy, we set up a four pillars, uh, I mean, represented by four R's. Uh, first R is renewing social contract. All social contract uh, of the region, which can be characterized by the state, is a provider of the job, and uh, some services, such as health and education, either free or very cheap, but in very poor quality. And also, state provide subsidized food and uh, also fuel. But as we have seen, what we have seen in the Arab Spring and aftermath, it didn't work. All social contract is broken. So we are now trying to work to renew social contract. Second part is a regional cooperation. Second R is surprisingly, despite those similarity of language and history and culture you know, in the region. When we look at the statistics, economic statistics, regional economic cooperation is very low among all, like other region, uh, Europe, Asia, or Latin America. Among Middle East, it's the lowest. So we would like to promote more regional economic cooperation. So that's second R. Third R is a, uh, resilience to refugee and economic migration. So again, because of protracted nature, I introduced about the global concessional finance facility. We try to engage more actively on this refugee crisis. Of course, humanitarian aid is very important, but it's not any longer, you know, only humanitarian areas business. I think somebody like the World Bank, us, really need to engage very actively. And fourth, uh, I'm sorry, I have become too long. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. Yeah, reconstruction and recovery. This is your question. Mm -hmm. And maybe big difference from our previous engagement and the current engagement is usually World Bank, compared with other humanitarian agencies, a bit timid and conservative in terms of engagement while conflict is going on. But we try to engage, if it's possible, to, I mean, uh, some engagement while conflict is going on. But of course, you know, we have still some institutional culture, but we are trying to do our best. And one example is like our current engagement with Yemen. Of course, World Bank is only part of the international development actors. So what we can do is quite limited. But <coughs> reinforcing partnership with UN agencies, we are currently uh, actively engaged in the Yemen, I mean, some humanitarian support as well. Thank huh. you. Wow, excellent. Thank you very much. You raised some uh, really interesting questions I want to come back to. But uh, turning to Claire, I think one of the uh, issues that uh, Hadiki raised is that uh, recovery and reconstruction is, is more than just money. It's more than just finances for rebuilding buildings. Uh, uh, it requires much more than just material resources. Communities also need to reestablish the rules and the norms uh, where people can come together and trust their government. Can you 
Can you talk to us a little bit about strategies for uh, building and rebuilding, but probably building in some cases, uh, that uh, trust for people who had been so uh, maybe persecuted by the very governments that they're coming back to, um, uh, to recover? C certainly, and um, <clears throat> um, very much agreeing with, with, with all the speakers that we're now not in a um, world where there's going to be a, any kind of uh, sequence between a humanitarian mm -hmm. closure and then a recovery, then a reconstruction. There's a simultaneity to all this. And also very much that putting this, this really the citizen at the center of our thinking um, as academics and analysts and policy makers is so central and the psychosocial dimension. So thank you all of you for, for putting that so squarely on the table. I think one thing as one approaches the question and, and re recognizing that in uh, very sadly, it's, we may be years away from this at the moment, but it's, it's never too early to start thinking and preparing and analyzing different futures. Um, I think the first is to really understand the historical and institutional basis. Because one of the lessons we've seen from um, countries around the world is when um, the international community in their rush to do good then imports the technical expertise, the institutions, the organizations, the firms. And of course, in many of these countries, and especially in the Middle East, there's just tremendous, tremendous capacity already there. Um, and that then sets the stage for citizens to be much more actively engaged and stakeholders in their own recovery. So they're going to be you know, incredible capacity within the you know, construction firms, within the institutions, the education sector, the health sector, um, and within community groups, citizen groups, civil society groups. So how does one understand what, what of that can be said? We're recognizing absolutely, Hikideki, that it's not a question of just restoring that old social contract, but citizen expectations have changed quite dramatically, especially with the demographic shift. I think the other one is to think, you know, and, and while it seems strange to think about a 20 or 30 or 50 year perspective, when there's such a sense of a, a real crisis um, mm -hmm. going on, but all the lessons have been that where recovery and reconstruction has been handled successfully, there were those who did begin to set the horizons to have that medium to long-term um, thinking. I think the other part is that there's, you know, there's a lot of interest, um, especially at the UN, in, in federalism and decentralization, which is absolutely right. The principle of subsidiarity that citizens must make decisions and, and power must be decentralized as much as possible. And as a principle, that's fine. But I think what a lot of countries and places are struggling with in practice is what does that actually mean in practice? And I think rather than just thinking simply about federalism for so many places, to think really to break that down to really which function is realistically going to be performed at which level. You know, you're not going to have 100 printing presses for money in every town. You know, some functions are going to have to still be at a, a fairly centralized level, but other decisions like on repair of irrigation canals could can be very much decentralized. So how do you really understand in a particular context what that architecture is? And especially with the emergence of the city as such an important unit of governance in today's world. And so, as Jonathan Fine was saying earlier, in Libya, of course, it's the municipality that's really critical. So that's the unit of governance. So really understanding this unit. And then I think this sets the stage for the more you can then appropriately decentralize decision-making and recovery into the hands of the stakeholders within the society, the more that, that they can take ownership of, of the process. Well, well that's, that's very good. I'm, I'm wondering how it actually works because uh, in conflict situations, buildings get bombed and they're reduced to rubble. But what also is broken are those supply chains from city to city that uh, 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 had, are so important for, for small businesses, uh, uh, communications lines, uh, the personal relations are, are broken. Uh, how do you repair that? Education systems are broken. There's a lot of systems that, uh, human systems that are also uh, broken after a conflict. Uh, so, so let me just challenge our thinking. Let us say we go into Yemen. The conflict stops. We go into Yemen. Uh, the Institute for State Effectiveness is asked to advise uh, the new who is ever there as leaders. What, how would you approach your advice to them? Um, so 
in, in maybe three or four blocks. I think one is to think very, very deliberately about the rules of the game around the reconstruction. You know, m money usually starts to flow in a recovery or reconstruction process, but money can be very corrosive as well as, as an essential fuel. So putting, the, again, the rule sets and the accountability. The familiar refrain in so many settings is after these vast donor conferences with billions of dollars pledged, three or four years later, people say, where did the money go? And mm -hmm. that's when you lose the trust. So putting in place, so the first is to put in place the accountability measures. Um, the second is where possible to decentralize. And so some examples, um, actually Yemen has a history of this, of, of um, decentralization with the social fund and previous programs in Yemen where um, decisions are taken by the communities. Um, a program many of you are familiar with, the Ketchmatan Development Project, was put in place in Indonesia across 80,000 villages after the Asian financial crisis in 97. So decisions and block grants decentralized to the villages. Um, and then they choose their own priorities. The same in yeah. Afghanistan with the National Solidarity Program. So these, and with the Syrian councils at the moment, it's a very similar methodology. So using this very radical decentralization, I think, should be considered. And then perhaps a third, third major point is on this um, question of the lost generation and the, the, the people involved. And what we're seeing in many societies that have, um, those have, that have succeeded and those that have failed, one of the critical, critical differences is succession in leadership, and not just the person at the top, but how does a generation that's maybe lost to years or decades of war, but how amongst them um, does a new cadre of leaders emerge? And what is the kind of support through education, through training, through leadership development that could be put in place so this new generation can come of age and increasingly take over responsibility? Yeah, that's very good and, and tricky. Michael, returning to some humanitarian issues, uh, Yemen, of course, is suffering from a health crisis with the cholera, uh, with the children, what, 60% of children in Yemen are underfed, many suffering from stunting. When, when you talked earlier about a lost generation uh, through mental health, but there's also just physical health issues, uh, what, what are, what's the humanitarian community doing to uh, address some of those issues in the middle of a conflict situation? Right, um, and it, it's, it's a very tough situation as you've just laid out. I mean, the, the first thing is it, it's tough already, and then to have an obstacle like closing the ports and closing the roads, and um, the, as the Saudi-led coalition has done, it makes, makes it almost impossible. And I think what we're seeing right now, we, given the, the nutritional state or malnutritional state of a lot of children in, in Yemen, you're looking probably even when we're doing humanitarian work, you're looking at maybe 50,000 kids dying this year. There's 130 a day. With this closure of the ports, with this blockade in place, if that persists, then a lot of the kind of support that we and others in the UN are providing will not be able to um, reach those in, in desperate need. And that you're going to, you're looking at about a 30% mortality rate of people who are suffering from some, some uh, severe acute malnutrition. So the numbers are going to skyrocket. And so that, that blockade needs to, needs to stop for humanitarian stuff. Um, so it, there is, I mean, Yemen was one of the four countries around the world that um, you know, was facing famine-like conditions. And I think um, the worst of the famine has been in, in this was Somalia. Um, and, and um, you know, northern Nigeria um, and Yemen. Um, and the, the worst of the famine-like conditions in South Sudan, um, I think, has been staved off. So it's not quite as bad as it was, say, six or nine months ago. But it, you know, three quarters of the population in Yemen relies on humanitarian assistance. And so it, it's a very dire situation. So we're, what, we're, what a lot of us are doing are things like uh, health clinics on the ground and mobile health clinics where you're providing you know, treatment for severe uh, acute malnutrition, um, just sort of really basic health care, things like that. The cholera there is probably the, uh, I'm told, I have not been to Yemen, I can't go to Yemen. Um, I, I'm told that I think the cholera outbreak is kind of one of the worst in history. I mean, it was, it was climbing up towards a million cases. And I think it's, I, what I've heard recently is it started to stabilize a little bit, but you're, you're talking 800,000, 900,000 cases of cholera. So this is a really, really difficult situation. And, and what needs to happen is we need to, you know, full force get, get as much humanitarian assistance in there as we can. And, and it, it takes the, we need to have that, we need to have that blockade list lifted. 
and then we need to be able to have the humanitarian access that's so critical so people that are suffering from malnutrition, you know, children um, in particular can get access to what they need. Yeah. Uh, Could I just add please. very quickly that access is such a huge issue for us today. It's actually decreasing around the world in humanitarian uh, cases, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that's harming a lot of populations. Yemen is a great, uh, great example. Three quarters of the population, as Mike said, depend on humanitarian supplies. Well, with the major port and airport closed, they're not getting in, and those people are now at risk. In Syria, the Assad regime will not allow uh, many UN convoys over conflict lines, so we have uh, pockets of populations there that don't get a, enough humanitarian aid. There needs to be a greater concentration around the world on pushing for free access for humanitarians. We, we face the same problem, it's not in your region, but in Rakhine, northern Rakhine State right now in Burma. Yeah, which I know, uh, Simon, I know you've just returned from Burma, uh, and it's worth noting that uh, while we're focused on the refugee crisis, uh, displaced crisis in the Middle East, there are 22 million uh, refugees throughout the world and <laughs> other crises as well that uh, I know uh, must deal with. And, but this whole issue of, of providing, and, and a couple of you have touched on it, uh, and, and maybe we've touched on it enough, but I wonder if there's not something that more that can be said about delivering both humanitarian assistance in the middle of a conflict zone, but also the need to start the recovery, to start building those trusts, building those institutions, um, uh, finding the leaders in the local communities uh, who are going to be part of the recovery and the stitching together again of society under, under the norms and the rules, determining what the rules are. Uh, for the delivery of aid that has to start even while the conflict is going on. And I, I wonder, I'll just open it up, the conversation just a little bit. Is there anything more you'd like to say about that? Maybe some examples of where it's worked well, where we've uh, managed to not just stop in our tracks when we find that the port is closed or uh, it's too dangerous to get in. How have we managed to work those workarounds into doing the work that needs to be done uh, in the middle of a conflict. Anybody, Mike? Sure, I'll just take a short step. Um, so part, it's less about sort of building bridges across, across groups and more about to be picking up on Claire's point. I mean, where's the future leadership gonna come from? Mm -hmm. So there is an effort, there's an initiative in the Middle East region that Save the Children, World Vision, Mercy Corps, um, UNICEF and a number of other partners have, have launched maybe three or four years ago called the No Loss Generation Initiative. And the two obvious components, one is education, the other is protection, which we can talk about if we want. But the third one, which is, goes to this issue, is really about youth participation. And, it's, and so what we try to do in a lot of our programs is really involve the people that you're, you know, you're trying to help, involve them in the decision making, involve them in the design of programs, and particularly you know, younger people, and in order to start building some leadership skills. And we do that, you know, we could do it consistently a lot better, but it's very much a part of the way we try to work on, on these programs. So the idea is you're in effect creating this, you know, giving, creating some of the skills that future leaders are gonna need um, to help put things back together again. And so it, it spans <coughs> the gamut. You can have, you know, things like child clubs, you can have youth that can get involved in designing programs. A lot of times when the, you know, the whole world shows up in New York around the UN General Assembly period, we, we have youth delegates, I mean, and they get accustomed to working the, you know, the corridors of the UN and meeting with officials. So we do a lot of things like that. And the goal is, is really to create, you know, help enable um, future leaders to hone their skills so they can then play that role in their society. Boy, that's certainly true in a, in a region where uh, uh, Sixty percent of the population is under 35, right. uh, and where governments and government institutions and most institutions, business, uh, every institution is run by old guys, old guys. Uh, so please stay around for the Nothing next. Nothing wrong with old guys. And what women are doing uh, in the region uh, to challenge uh, the norms. Uh, that comment is very good. Claire, you wanted to say something. Yes, a couple of things. So one is just going sort of more deeply into this question, this notion of leadership at really multiple levels, and it's this leadership at the community level and the municipal level that is so, so important. And just to give you some, maybe a little bit more examples from both these programs in Indonesia and Afghanistan that people, the, the villagers elect, they choose to, to elect. 
um, councils. And over time, these council leaders serve at the village level, and then the ones that emerge then go on to serve at the district level. They emerge, they serve at, I mean, and Jokowi in Indonesia is actually a product of having served on a village council. And so over the years, and this is, again, with the importance of these timelines of 20, 30 years, this helps to generate a new leadership. I'd say this just adding to that is the, just the real importance of the economy and whether you mentioned it that right now the supply chains are broken and so on. Um, when I um, interviewed some special representatives of the Secretary General who were responsible for facilitating or overseeing peace processes a few years ago, I asked them what their biggest regret was. And nearly all of them said that their biggest regret was not paying sufficient attention to the economy. They said the economy was something they thought could wait until security and the political process was established. And then they said they actually realized that the economy is happening all around you all the time. And it's either going to be a legitimate economy or it's going to be a criminal and illegitimate and informal economy. Um, and that's going to just poison the politics again. And the second reason they said, of course, it's tremendously important is jobs for young men and, and young women. But so how are these jobs going to be provided? And I think if we take that sort of citizen perspective again, um, for these highly educated populations, what's their stake in the future? And so to do this, which I think the World Bank is rightly doing now, this sort of long-term thinking about what, the, what are the future economies going to look like? Where are the jobs going to be? A lot of them are going to be in the public sector, in teaching and in healthcare. Um, but what are the economies of the future? And to align those education systems um, and start, as I think you, you know, you're saying, training now um, cadres of people in the skill sets that the future country is, is going to need and not to and, and to use this time for this. I think the United States could could take some wisdom from, or <laughs> take some uh, notes from that uh, comment. Uh, Hadiki, that yes. uh, opens up very nicely to you. Uh, what is the World Bank doing? Right. Uh, just uh, going back to your question about our engagement, you know, during conflict, how are we going to do it? And uh, I would say um, Iraq, after 2003 US-led invasion, was uh, probably the first case of the large scale in conflict engagement of the international community, I think. Uh, because like, you know, in the peak of the, you know, I mean, the worst security situation period, probably 2006 to 2007, uh, casualty of civilian per day was 100. Monthly, 3,000 people were killed, and in that you know situation, how are we gonna, how can, how can we engage? You know, it's extremely difficult. I think uh, work, and I myself started to engage in Iraq 2003, right after invasion, and ended up doing it for eight years. So it was really a very, very difficult process. And because of the security situation, we really need to compromise you know, so many things, efficiency, effectiveness as well. But still, there are people who really desperately in need of some kind of support. For that sake, really have to do it. But still, we are in the process of learning you know, what was really the lesson from such a difficult in conflict engagement. And if I would say, summarize a failure in few words, maybe the biggest failure of the Iraq reconstruction after spending 220 billion US dollars is uh, probably we failed from, since I work for World Bank, you know, biggest mistake on economic side is failure to di diversify economy. Still, it continues to rely on heavily on oil. And uh, another issue is we failed to Establish the inclusive governance or institutions. So that's really another issues we failed, and uh, there are so so many lessons you know we can learn. But uh, uh, those are points, and um, it's still you know we are in the middle of learning process. And when I think about somewhere like Syria, it is going to be even more difficult because first of all we would have a very challenging situation to identify what is really the needs of the people. We can identify humanitarian needs, but uh, you know, what is the middle to long term needs? And also, who is going to be our partner to work with? It's really a challenging situation. I don't have a clear answer yet, but that's, we are still trying to figure out. <coughs> well, uh, in Syria, 
I mean, if, if you, let me just vent, challenge uh, the, the panel in the audience. And Syria, it looks like your partners might be uh, Iran, Russia, and China. Because from my reading, those are the three, three donor countries that are stepping up and are rushing to uh, Damascus, looking for the big reconstruction contracts. And when they get those fi financial re reconstruction contracts, uh, you can bet that they'll, their values will play into the institution building that will be going, uh, that will be going along as part of the recovery in Syria. Um, any comments about that? What are you seeing from the World Bank and from the United States and from an NGO perspective? Okay, yeah, Syria is um, quite, as I said, very challenging situation. And since, you know, usually we are not, World Bank is not entering to, you know, political sphere. And uh, I, I don't, you know, have clear answer, you know, from political perspective. But uh, instead of that direct answer, let me just introduce our recent, if I may, you know, studies on Syria, because we are, still uh, trying to figure out what would be the effective way to engage in Syria in the future. But for that sake, we need to, uh, first of all, understand the situation. But again, our analysis is from economic perspective, not political perspective. But that said, the issue is, the, I mean, we try to assess social and economic consequences of Syrian conflict from three perspective. One is a you know, humanitarian effect, second is a physical damage, and third is economic uh, consequences. But since I start you know, elaborating, it's, it's going to be long. So I would just summarize the economic aspect. You know, just if we calculate, estimate the cumulative damage, economic damage of Syrian war is already above 220 billion US dollars. And if this, you know, I mean, war goes on three more years, uh, already 220 billion is four times as of Syrian GDP. So to reconstruct, Syria is going to be a, I mean, huge job. But if it continues three years, another five years, it, the, you know, damage is going to be 10 times more. So again, coming back to Wendy's first statement of donor fatigue. There is not going to be any donor, whether even Russia or China, whoever. It's just too much. And what makes the matter worse, this is damage is only tip of the iceberg. Destruction, more serious destruction is, as we talk about mental you know, damage and so on, destruction of social capital, trust, network, yeah. you know, community, mm -hmm. and so on and destruction of institutions, yeah. as well as a destruction of business network. Even before the 2011, it was pretty much elite capture. But you know, those all intangible things were totally destroyed. So not only the you know, 200 billion and so on, as Wendy said, money is only part of the ball game. Money alone will not solve the problem. We really have to look at those intangible factors very seriously, and how, you know, as an international, I mean, community as a whole to tackle it. That's really a challenge of us. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree with everything you've said, uh, Hidaki. But I, but I don't think you can, can look at it outside of the political sphere. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, in Iraq, in six months' time, there's going to be a national election in Iraq. Uh, yet we've just come uh, from the position of having pretty much destroyed Mosul uh, and other cities in the efforts to evict ISIS. Wonderful thing, evict ISIS. But uh, there are many, many, many hundreds and thousands of, of civilians who have also fled their homes, can't go back, uh, are displaced, are refugees. And, and, and the problem isn't just refugees and IDPs. Uh, it's, it's what do you do about the children who were born under ISIS rule in Mosul uh, who were given birth certificates that are not recognized by the Baghdad government? 
What do you do with the couples who were married under ISIS rules whose marriage licenses aren't recognized because it was an ISIS document? There are, are just a multitude of political problems that are going to be very much part and parcel to the recovery. And, and, uh, and, and that will all feed in to this election that's coming up in six months. Because you've got, a, you've got a dis, if you don't deliver assistance, don't solve these questions, not just financial, but the federalism questions, the involvement of local people in their governments, if you don't bring them in, if they continue to be excluded, then they will continue to be marginalized. And, and let's face it, it, it is along ethnic and, and, and sectarian grounds. And you're, good, you're caught in this, this horrible loop where they will be vulnerable to exploitation by the next group that comes along after Al Qaeda and ISIS, and there will be one, unless uh, the international community helps somebody, I guess, Baghdad, but, but responsible leaders in addressing the needs of these marginalized people, and it has to be soon. And I'm just wondering who's thinking about that? Who's taking the leadership? Uh, is it the US government? Is it the international organizations? Is it NGOs? Is it uh, really responsible think tanks? Who's taking the leadership in this really emergent and urgent problem? Uh, and I, I don't know the answer to it. Well, I don't else? think there's one. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I don't think there's one answer. It's a multitude of problems. Uh, war, war is horrible. It causes vast destruction. Everything from physical to to non tangible items, as as you were just saying. So you have to, to break it down the the issues country by country and region by region and work on them. In Syria, I don't think there can be any solution, any reconstruction until there's political reconciliation. Because without political reconciliation, you can't build the trust and the relationships you need to rebuild the country. I also don't think that Iran and Russia can provide enough of the resources to rebuild the country so that the West will inevitably have to have a role there, but is unlikely to have one again without political reconstruction. In, in Yemen, it's, you know, it, it's much more of a Saudi and a UAE issue where uh, the United States and others play a, play a role, but we need to pressure the UAE and the, the Saudis to look for a political solution. The one good thing about Yemen is that the situation there was relatively bad beforehand, so it doesn't take a lot of work to get back to, to where they were before. And it's kind of a sad way of putting things, but it's true. <laughs> um, you know, compare that with Syria, which was incredibly well developed. That, that's a really long road to hoe to get it back to anywhere near it was. And then Iraq is, a, is a, a separate issue where I think the United States obviously still plays a very large role and in which we need to get the various parties to come to political reconciliation so that they can move ahead, get populations back to where they are at work, and begin re reconstruction. And they, they certainly have a solid financial base with oil money, but they, need, they can't move forward with that until they have some uh, political reconciliation and some, a political way forward. Hey, Vicky, last comments before we open it up for the uh, questions from the audience. No, I, I think when the, you you totally right, and uh, you know, all issue is not only you know economic issue; it's all political economy, you know, in the region. So even if the World Bank, we are not specialized in the you know political arena, without solving those issues you just raised, those generation, new generation. I mean, let's say Iraq, not only new generation. Iraq has really a cycle. You know of all the histories, Iran, Iraq war, Gulf war, and the economic sanctions, and the invasion of the 2003, and this you know fighting with ISIS, and at each segment of those you know I mean histories, there are certain generation who really suffered, and what's happening right now in Iraq is because uh, when I first went to like 2003. Uh, there are lots of capable, actually, Iraqi in their age, like 50s, 60s. They grew up in the golden age of education during 60s and 70s. And they're very capable, I mean, international standards, but most of them retired. And next generation is 
grew up in the, their peak of educational work uh, during like economic sanction, then their capacity, of course, depends on person and experience is less. And you just mentioned those people who were born in the middle of you know, ISIS rule and so on. I, I'm, I, I really feel sorry for them, but those are part of Iraqi and part of the problem and really need to figure out how to solve it. Human capital is really the key. Human capital, human capital. Uh, Michael? Yeah, so I think from, um, I think from a perspective of, of an, a development a humanitarian NGO like Save the Children, what I would say is that we have a role to play in what you've described, but, but we don't think about it as sort of um, a political role. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I would say is that just as we were talking about development and humanitarian sort of being connected in a different way nowadays, I think you can, you know, maybe 20 years ago, when a lot of what we're trying to do is sort of reduce the absolute level of poverty. And I think over the last decade or so, it's become clear that, you know, absolute poverty is going down, but it's these inequities yeah. that are really coming much more into view. And so when, when, the U, when world leaders adopted this next set of development goals in uh, 2015, they talked about these really bold goals, but also talked about leaving nobody behind. And so when the way Save the Children, for example, thinks about its work, we've identified three big breakthroughs that we want to drive uh, toward for 2030, but really focus on those that are furthest behind from you know, achieving these breakthroughs, which is ending preventable child deaths, every child learning through a quality education, and then sort of violence against kids is no longer tolerated. Those are our three big North Stars. I know you can only have one, but we got three. Um, and, and so we're thinking about if, if we want to get there, you got to really go after the ones that are hardest to reach and are furthest behind. And so that really does force you into thinking about which groups within society are, are being marginalized. Because it, it's not by accident you know, that this happens. You have, you know, in some societies, it's girls that are getting left behind, and others, it's ethnic minorities. And we've done a, a lot of work on this. And we came out with an index in, um, on June 1st, which looked at what, what's ending childhood prematurely. You know, if a child dies of pneumonia, you know, that's kind of end of childhood. Mm -hmm. But it's other things like being forced out of your home, um, you know, getting married as a child, this, dropping out of school, it's these kinds of things. And when you look at these childhood enders, and we rank countries by that, you can also look at how does that play in a country across different groups. And what you find are the, you know, more, the marginalized and excluded groups are the ones that are really um, have the worst you know, performance on these, on these uh, kind of indices. And so those are the ones we're really focused on. And I think by doing that kind of work, it's not only programmatic work, it's also calling our, in, in country, most of our staff in country are nationals. I mean, 98% most of the time, something like that. So they're very active in calling attention to these kinds of issues. And I think that's what you need. You need organizations like us to be calling attention to these disparities so that they, they're called out and they start, people start coming to grips with them. And that's the role that we can, you know, we can play in that kind of process. Excellent, thank you. Claire? And, and just to underscore the absolute importance in, in addressing the very specific concern, concerns and issues of the marginalized and the particularly vulnerable. And I think while a lot of the Middle East region is, is very, very wealthy, there are also pockets of extreme poverty. So also in terms of when we look at marginalization, it's the question of poverty in the much poorer regions. And there's so much rich experience globally in different forms of social policy and the innovations that are going on that I think could have real application. Um, I think at the same time as paying particular attention to the marginalized, um, also because in many post-conflict settings or ongoing conflict settings, trust is so low, um, then how do you do that without you know, any one group you focus on, the other groups are going to feel excluded because you're focused on them. So how do you balance the attention on the vulnerable group groups and the marginalized with a sense of fa I mean, fairness is, as a theme is just so important. Mm. People want to be treated fairly, and this is part of dignity. So how do you um, balance that with a balanced approach, whether it, where possible it's countrywide or regionwide or citywide, that there are s criteria um, to the benefits to the services that people are going to receive? Mm, fairness and dignity. I, I like that. Thank you. Uh, I th I think this is the time that we were supposed to open it up for your questions. You've been very patient. Uh, please line up behind the microphones. That's the drill. And uh, we'll take uh, question, question, question. We'll take four questions at a time, two from here and two from there, uh, and open it up to the panel. 
So let's sure. start here. Quick question, Blake Selzer. I worked uh, in the Syria region for International Humanitarian Organization. Questions for um, Assistant Secretary Henshaw. First, thanks for your service. We hear people thanking military service. I'd like to thank political career service people as well. Thank um, you for that. And um, the work you guys do is incredibly important. I agree with you in terms of we've made some strides in uh, education and work uh, abilities for refugees in neighboring countries. Those are long, hard fought. Um, victories for those of us doing advocacy. Um, my question is really about, and the support from the U.S. is incredibly important, but my question is, since this is a policy discussion on conflicts, costs, and policy pathways, the current administration's policy to cut in half the number of refugees being admitted to the U.S. from 110,000 to 45,000, how is that being perceived internationally? Because when we're trying to push Jordan, Lebanon, and others to take in more refugees themselves, we're cutting in half our numbers. How is that seen in your experience? Uh, if you can answer this question. Thank you. Okay, question over here. Hi, my name is Selena Ibrahim from St. Timothy School. I have a question. So in the beginning, you mentioned programs that you're doing to help with children's mental health. And I was just wondering if you ever faced a block with parents, maybe if they have different cultural biases against mental health issues. Good question. Here. Yeah, and this is almost a follow up on that. Um, I'm Lebanese American, I'm a cross culture educator and an art therapist, so I was very interested in the mental health aspect of your discussion. But also what I've seen from art therapists trying to go into Syria or Lebanon to help refugees, having absolutely no idea about the culture. So how do you address that, taking something that may be wonderful in a Western society, uh, and I have, and even here we have male psychology, which is very different from female psychology. How are you addressing people who go there to help or to train? And I, I really appreciate what Ms. Lockhart said to train the local population, both the refugee population, but also the host country uh, population but also sensitizing them and educating them about the culture they're going in. Because if you don't create trust, I'm a therapist, I did art therapy in Saudi Arabia, which I never thought I would do. And, and so it, how do you address that cultural training of those who are amazing and are going there to help with all their heart? And that is my concern, thank good, you. Good, let's take one more from, from here and then we'll answer. Uh, my name's Hila Haidari. Uh, as a refugee myself, uh, I've had first-hand understanding of how disparate the experiences can be uh, between refugees and other immigrant groups. So my question is, um, what feasibly uh, should host countries do to help uh, to address the unique needs of refugees uh, to help them integrate better into society so that they're not alienated uh, by these negative images of their country, their representations of their country, or uh, overwhelmed by, as you mentioned, the psychological duress that they face? Thank you. Open it up to the panel. So I, I guess I'm first. Uh, thank you very much for uh, noting our service. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so the effect of our admissions reduction in numbers on support for or, or what the view of that is in foreign countries uh, housing refugees, I think they focus far more on our financial support. Our impact has always been far greater in what we do overseas. 85% of PRM's money goes to supporting assistance for refugees in overseas. Um, and when we're talking about whether it was uh, the last administration's 85,000 or this administration's 45,000, it's still a relatively small number compared with the 25 million refugees around the world. So I, I, I think that uh, what countries focus on is the support we're giving them to, to house refugees inside their country. I do think that they see it as an important part. It's, a, it's an important program. It's a program that I certainly support. Uh, uh, under the right security uh, constraints, but um, uh, they're probably still waiting to see how the reduced numbers impact their populations in each country. And that won't be clear for a few months, I think, and then we'll, we'll start to get a reaction. Though, again, I, I, am, I think the focus will continue to be on the, the huge amount of support that we give overseas. Vicky, did you have anything to say? 
Um, you don't have to. Yeah, that. maybe uh, I would like to respond to the lady's question, if sure. I may, uh -huh. about uh, what uh, I couldn't catch so well, but what host community can do, you know, for refugee. And of course, it depends on country and depends on refugee situation. It's quite different. But uh, uh, what the World Bank, uh, relatively newcomer to their, this refugee area. What, for example, I like to just introduce one example. What we are trying to do is in Jordan is we have been having a lot of, I mean, policy dialogue with the government of Jordan, and ask them to provide work permit to refugees and formalize their work because most of the refugees tends to work in informal sector in a very hazardous, dangerous and uh, you know dear situation but uh, we have been talking with Jordanian government to formalize it but instead we have been talking with EU and those uh, companies who has certain percentage who um, which employ the certain number I mean, refugee can export to EU market in a preferential status, same like free trade. So it's like a win-win, you know, sort of situation we try to create through this kind of policy dialogue. So first of all, you know, those people living there, as Michael said, tends to be protracted situations. So whether, you know, they really have a good job or not, that's really matters a lot. And we try to uh, sort of create such environment through such political policy dialogue. Yeah, and I might say Turkey has done some amazing work in this area. It probably didn't get enough credit for it, but it, uh, it gives work permits to refugees and it uh, sets up schools for Syrian refugees within Turkey. Uh, Claire, sure. And then you can wrap up. Anything? Okay. OK, so I want to do both the, that latter point, but also on the mental health point, you're absolutely right. Um, excellent questions, excellent points, and I, I support them 100%. We don't show up and say, hi, I'm Dr. Sigmund. I'm going to make you better. That, that's not how this works. It's very much it, all of the, the strategies that we use are, 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 are tailored to the, the, the situation at hand. And the people that are doing this work, I mean, inside Syria, we're doing um, some fairly, as I said, fairly basic level um, mental health, psychosocial services provision and it's it's all Syrians we're not there's no Americans that we employ or Brits or others that are doing the work inside Syria so it's very much the nationals in the countries that we work that do this and it has to be brought out in such a way that it, it may, it's it's tailored it's adapted um, and and particularly you know whether parents if parents are not interested in it they're not interested in it and we find this situation in a lot of places for example trying to get girls in school where this is not hasn't been the the culture I mean we have to come up with smart strategies for for helping, um, you know, try to bring those types of things about. So I agree with you. It has to be culturally tailored, and that's pretty much what we do. And I'd be glad to have a conversation with with both of you if you'd like. On the integration point, I think um, there's a real there's been a real big push over the number of years that that the, there's a real burden that the refugee hosting countries are are have assumed by, by doing this. And so there's an understanding that, that they shouldn't alone, and a lot of these countries are not the wealthiest countries in the world, in many instances, when you think about where a lot of the refugee populations are. So there's this, there's this um, push to have more mutual accountability, more mutual responsibility uh, in, in place to do that. And so um, there's a, coming out of some UN summits last year, there's, there's a now a big effort to put in place a global compact on refugees and a separate one on migration. And the idea in there is sort of mutual responsibility. And so we, you know, NGOs like Save the Children, when I was talking earlier about the most deprived, if you take all the forcibly displaced people in the world, you know, 65 million or so, put them in one country, they're the 21st largest country in the world. Huh. And if you look at the statistics of the kids, you know, in terms of their health status, educational status, it's bad. So for, for the way we're looking at the refugees in particular, which is a subset of those, um, is that this is a group that is, you know, across the world is quite marginalized and they need some special attention. So within this global compact on refugees, we've been pushing, for example, for um, host com governments to, you know, put kids into school, um, but they shouldn't alone have to bear the burden of that. So that they bring the kids into their national education systems, but there's other resources, World Bank, as, as Hideki's been talking about in Jordan and Lebanon. You work out a way where, where the international community as a whole is working together in this comprehensive refugee response framework. So hopefully it'll be a lot clearer by the end of uh, next year when all this is supposed to be wrapped in a little bow tie on top of it. Claire, thank you, Brett. 
Um, just a couple of quick comments, and, and again, I, I'm not trained in, in psychotherapy at all, but from what I've observed is, the so one is in, in so many of these societies, there aren't very, very many professionally trained psychotherapists, and there isn't going to be the you know, right. ability to bring in lots from the outside. Where people can, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, but what are the um, traditional and cultural ways that, that the societies have through storytelling, through narrative, through arts and culture, at um, dealing with their past? or dealing with, with um, trauma and difficult issues. And I think sort of looking for those mechanisms within the societies um, is, is one important past, part. There was a conference a few years ago convened by the UN and the World Bank where a group of former heads of states who had handled very difficult <coughs> post-conflict transitions got together. And when they were reflecting on what they thought that they had performed poorly on, they said the hardest thing they found was, was dealing with the past and dealing with this issue of intergroup trust and the trauma. And they felt that they hadn't, this was what the international community had failed to pay enough attention to. And then they themselves didn't create the space for, for getting that right as, as hard as it is. Good. Question? Uh, this is Nasser Naimi. I'm a student in international relations um, at Virginia International University. Uh, my question is specifically about Afghanistan. Um, uh, thank you very much, Michael. You brought up some of the points regarding the educations of those children and about their shelter and basic needs. But one of the points which was not discussed in the panel was the deportation, actually. Uh, because um, from Afghanistan, the refugee perspective, you see that they lose all of their properties and they sell everything in order to reach to the uh, European countries um, and some of them even being killed on the borders and being killed in the Mediterranean seas. But at the end when they reach their safe, they are being deported. Even uh, last month it was a report that 10,000 refugees are waiting to be deported from there. So is there any policy for them that what they will do back in their countries when they lost everything there? Thank you. Hi, um, Sam Schneider. I'm a consultant with the World Bank. Um, so my question is about the intersection of development and uh, refugee repatriation. So we've talked a little bit about um, programs to create a more friendly environment um, and positive environment for refugees in host countries. But I'm interested about what um, efforts right now exist and what opportunities there are for making sure that when refugees are repatriating, they're going back with more skills, uh, job opportunities, and for the high net worth individuals, capital mobilized to reinvest in uh, their communities. Thank you. That good. That's a good follow on to the last question. Thank you. Yes? Hi, I'm Sophie Spencer with the Syria Institute. Um, first, thank you to the panelists and moderator for participating today. My question is, what is the plan for the U.S. and coordinating organizations like the World Bank? Um, what's their plan on recovery and reconstruction in areas, that have, in areas of Syria that have been intentionally destroyed and depopulated and effectively demographically engineered by the Syrian government and its allies? Thank you. Yes? Hi, my name is Amani. I am Egyptian. I work for the local government in Philadelphia, and I am an economist. I have a comment, or actually a question, to Ms. Ambassador. When Mr. Hidaki said that uh, it's really difficult for them to identify partners to work with in Syria, you thankfully suggested they can work with some uh, countries who are interested in getting contracts in Syria. So my question is, and since the crisis that's happening in the MENA region requires all the different uh, political actors and countries to get involved for the reconstruction process, how or what are the suggestions that you would have or say uh, to have those um, uh, partners uh, working, making sure that they are working for the benefit of the country, not for their own benefit, since the long-term goal is to have the country growing and having peace and stability. Thank you. Panel? I'll, I'll take it. Uh, the, on the deportation question, I would say, um, I mean, what, what we do in, in, in with the European governments is we use our voice and we, we you know, sort of um, criticize moves to send people, you know, not give refugee status to people who have a well-founded uh, fear of persecution. So we, do, we call out European governments that are, that are doing that. 
Um, on the refugee repatriation part, I think a lot of the work that we're doing to help refugees in, in countries where they're in, in countries for a protracted period of time are, are also play the other role of giving them some skills to take back. So if, you're, if we're pushing to have refugees um, you know, be, be educated, that is gonna give them skills whether they're staying in that country for a long time or they're going back to their own country. Um, that gives them some you know, marketable skills. That's the, that's the way we look at it. And uh, we also have some of the programs, for example, I saw that we do in, in uh, Egypt where we're actually matchmaking between Egyptian companies and, and refugees and, and they're getting, the refugees are being able to support themselves um, in, while they're there, but they're also getting skills that could be useful back home. So I think that's, that's one of the ways that NGOs play a role in this space. Excellent. I would just uh, say that one of the difficult issues we work with today is mixed migration. So in any movement of migrants, there are legitimate refugees and, and then there are people that are economic refugees or fall into other categories. Um, and nations make decisions on whether or not they see uh, refugees as, uh, the migrants as refugees or not, and those that they don't are, are returned, and it is a, an issue that the world is grappling with right now. It's one reason why, the, why we have global migration talks. Uh, until there are more legal pathways for migrants to move, uh, we'll, we'll continue to face this, and we'll continue to face arguments of whether or not a migrant is a refugee or not. Um, we, we run training programs uh, in, all our, in almost all our sites, uh, probably not enough of them, but uh, the ones that I visit are, uh, cover a, a wide range of, uh, of uh, skills, everything from, I've been in computer labs to uh, woodworking shops to um, sewing, so it, de it depends on the culture. Uh, and, and the need, but we run a lot of livelihood programs so that people will have skills when they return home. And then on the question, I, I think it was a question over here on sort of uh, paying for NGOs and what the long-term effect is on the, on the country. Uh, I think that's, that really gets to the question of balancing uh, NGO employment between foreigners and locals, and I think we do a really good job of hiring lots of locals. Uh, I've, everywhere I've been, we, we see NGOs with large local staffs, and we're very supportive of that. But there is a balance where you do need some foreign staff. For instance, in times when there are political issues with the government, it's good to have foreign staff that have more protection and can, can be less pressured. And there are other reasons that you need foreign staff at, the, at, at certain areas, but there is an emphasis on using local staff so that uh, they can get the skills that they'll need to move the country forward once the NGOs have left. We're running very low on time, so let's just take these last three questions and then have one more round. Actually, I see four, huh? Mm -hmm. Last four questions, real quick. Make Make your question quick. Okay, let's start over here then. Sure, hi, my name is Jessica Eldesoki. I work at the State Department. Um, and my question is, I wanted to know what the panelists thought of, um, about their experience with the perceptions of host governments and receiving international assistance. Are the governments that you're working with, are they ever concerned that receiving this kind of assistance maybe will you know, encourage the refugees to stay, especially because of the uncertainty that we've talked about in political processes and um, a lot of the assistance is focused on educational opportunities and jobs and, and things like that. Thanks. Okay, you ready? <clears throat> One concern in the Middle East. They have political weakness and upheaval. Education, destruction, now children left there, what do they do with the concerns? What are some of your concerns that you guys have about how to deal with Education. these kids? Education. Concerns on how to deal with the education of the students? Okay, I think we got that. What are the concerns about uh, uh, educating some of the some of the kids, yeah. 
not 100% direct, but what's happening around them of course can be stopped and they're still getting some of the negative impact yeah. from what's happening around them. How do we approach that? Excellent question. Okay. Okay. Yes. Hi, uh, Janet Breslin Smith from Crosswinds. Um, one of the strange qualities about getting old is that I realize I've been to panels like this for 50 years. And one of the questions I have and the challenges, to, especially Wendy, following on what you said and, and all of you, can you imagine a setting where you would actually tackle what Wendy's talking about? In other words, all of you mentioned, and certainly my military students of the War College, we'll talk about we need more inclusive government, we need more responsive government, et cetera. And yet we only seem to talk about this in a crisis situation. Can you imagine setting up something regionally with the support of the institute, the bank, others, to actually address these core, core issues of governance now, in between crisis, or, or as a foundational level? Because everything you're talking about, economics, job creation, governance and inclusiveness, all of these are fundamental issues that only the region can resolve themselves. So I would hope you would do that. Thank you, Janet. Last question, and then we'll... Ahmad Ali, uh, actually I'm asking about the role of international community and World Bank in supporting the hosting countries for refugees in creating jobs for refugees and as well making balance with the domestic needs. Uh, already job market in countries like Egypt, Jordan, Turkey is already struggling. People there like labor <coughs> struggling in those countries and how we can make this kind of like balancing between refugees need to work in those countries hosting and the need of people of living in these hosting countries like the domestic laborers. Thank you. Uh, okay, last comments. Very, round. very We're quick gonna... answer to host government perceptions. They, they're not unified in a country. Different people have different views. Different ministers have different views, and they change over time. At first, countries are a little resistant to having any programs that will be long term because they want to tell their population that the new refugee pro population will leave soon. But as reality sits, sets in and they find that the population is there for a while, they seek greater international help in stabilizing the population. So it's important for foreign governments and international organizations to realize that there's going to be a change over time and, and to work with this and, and balance what we ask well, to match the political realities that politicians face in their home countries. Okay, just I would like to touch upon the possible tension, you know, concerning job, you know, with the host, I mean, uh, communities or, you know, citizen of that nationals and so on. So it, of course, you know, depends on the country and depends on the situation, whether uh, those refugees live in a community or live in a camp, you know, situation is <coughs> really totally different. So I really cannot uh, generalize it, but all, always, you know, there is certain uh, tension there. But uh, at the same time, if I look at, uh, we, we have conducted some of the studies of the economic impact of those refugees, and there are certain positive impact as well. And uh, like, for example, Jordan, right now they really accommodate so many Syrian refugees, but in the past they accommodated the uh, Iraq refugee, 800,000 Iraq refugee. And now Ministry of Minister himself would say there was lots of positive impact you know, out of it. And uh, of course, you know, depends on the, I mean, refugee and situation is really uh, different, but we really have to be very careful and uh, totally needs to be aware of that sensitivity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to recognize very much the question and the emphasis on protecting the children who are stuck in the middle of conflict, <coughs> which has nothing to do with them. And I think um, special, special attention needs to be paid to this generation from a protection perspective. Um, but also back to these programs that can build on the social capital. One example I know well is it from in Afghanistan at the height of the fighting through the 90s, and then the Taliban regime, there were these community fora where the local communities would organize photography, judo, and basic education and try and keep life as normal as possible for this generation. So there are examples of how it can be done. And then second, I think this question of during the conflict, what normally happens is then when a conflict ends, and inshallah, hopefully it, 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 they, they end, then there's a rush to, to plan, and the timelines are so short. So to, you, to the question of the lady on the, on the right. Janet. Janet. Um, I think it's such an important how to use this time responsibly. Um, and if I look at a case I know well, which is Afghanistan, as I watched today, two of the three um, initiatives that are most popular in, in the surveys that come out 
actually had their roots in people who had the foresight to say we need to start now planning now for what comes after. And one was this community for a program, just building social facilitators and a whole network of people who wanted to build rather than destroy. And then the second was people, and it was a lot of it was individual action, who took refugees and they made sure they would help them get their education and help nurture this next generation who are now 20 years later coming into their 30s and 40s and stepping into leadership, but without the people who took that initiative to, to train this next generation, this new generation of leaders wouldn't have been possible. So, but to agree, and I think in, in terms of a sort of an initiative in, in, in the Middle East, I'll leave that to Wendy's judgment and, and expertise, but as, as I've looked at this area, I, I see an enormous need for it, but also that there's a tremendous amount going on. We started with a sort of mapping exercise, and I think we, we stopped when we counted 65 different initiatives across the Middle East, and some of them sort of local and civic groups or international organizations. Um, and, and as a whole sum. So it's, it's to be able to network and create platforms and connections amongst them so they can share ideas is, is tremendously needed. Michael. Sure, so on the question of um, perceptions of host uh, governments, I think that's a, that's a terrific question. I think with Simon's answer, it actually points up the need for dialogue. Um, and certainly the way um, these issues are, are best addressed is not to go to a host government and say, you know, this is what you should do. So when we're talking, in, whether it's in um, the Middle East or in other countries, when we're talking with host officials, the, the whole point is to help understand what's the problem you're trying to deal with and then sort of what can you bring to bear as part of a mutually identified solution. And, and that's, that's kind of how, how you can, these things can over time can kind of move along. So it's really, it's not a question of thou shalt, but rather a question of here's what I can bring to bear and, and what's the problem you're facing. And for example, in some of the Middle East countries, the, the refugee populations are not in camps. They're actually not settling in the swanky parts of town. They're in the really pretty marginalized communities. And those communities are also suffering from the same, some of the same problems that refugees are suffering from. So what we're advocating for and what we do in our programming is not just if you're a refugee, you get you know, sort of favored and if you're not, too bad. It's really trying to build bridges across the refugee populations with the host communities. And that's one way to sort of move, this, move that process forward. Um, on on the, the question of children, it's, that's, that's what keeps me awake at night. That's what we're all about, and it, it's a terrific question. And I would completely agree with what, what Claire is saying. I think in the first instance, it really, what we find when we've looked at some of these issues is that where, where the family unit is intact, it's really the family, family unit, it's the family that's protecting the children. And we see that you know, in very difficult circumstances. I mean, some of the work we did on Iraqi kids, if, if, if the family was all together and the child was with the family, those children are much better off than kids who are sort of separated or, or not. So that's the first responsibility and the best mechanism, frankly, is, is the family. Beyond that, it just goes back to what I said earlier and I won't repeat it on the kind of sort of fairly basic uh, support that we provide through these things called child-friendly spaces that do seem to make a difference. Well, I'm very happy because this panel has done exactly what I'd hoped it would do. It has provided uh, any number of very positive, constructive ideas to how to deal with the problems rather than just whining about them. So uh, a round of applause to, uh, for an exceptional panel. <laughs>